Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Welcome to What Does Anti-Racist Sex Work Look Like? Uh, my name is Mistress Velvet, and I will be today's panelist host. Um, we are gonna have such an exciting and robust conversation. I'm so excited to introduce all the folks that we have today. Um, before I get into it, let me just talk a little bit about myself. So I am Chicago's premier African dominatrix. I have been a sex worker for 10 and a half years. I've done anything that you could possibly think of. Um, and I'm most known for my BDSM practice where I teach uh, white cis men around uh, you know, black feminist liberation um, and things around consent and interpersonal dynamics and just how to be better for black folks, spe specifically black queer femmes. So today's panel on anti-racist sex work is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we're gonna be talking about how we can dismantle systemic racism within our industry. Standing together is the strongest weapon we have against those who oppress black, brown, trans, disabled, and other marginalized people and often silenced voices. No one should be alone even if they're independent in this work. No one should be denied access to fundamental or integral information because they can't afford it. With so much pressure from civilians and anti-sex groups, we don't have room for hierarchy and gatekeeping in our own community and surviving should not be a luxury, which is why I think it is critical that we embody anti-racist anti -racist practices, practices in our work and in our community in order to further the liberation of all sex workers and all oppressed people. So we're gonna get into it today. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. We got three amazing people today. First, we have Dirty Lola. Hi, Dirty. So Dirty Lola is a sex edutainer, a speaker, and a self-proclaimed dildo slinger. Love that, slinger. Known for her live sex ed Q&A show called Sex ed -A go, go And as a co-host of New York Magazine's The Cuts Sex Probs web series, Lola has spent almost a decade working to end stigma and shame surrounding sex and sexuality. Having started her journey sharing personal discoveries with polyamory and kink online, Lola now uses her knowledge, warm candor, love that, and public platforms to teach the masses in person and to wrap in internet audiences. In addition to her educational projects, Lola is also the creative director of Spectrum Journal, on, on an online magazine offshoot of the female-owned online sex shop, Spectrum Boutique, based in Detroit, represent, and has brought her unique brand of sex-positive education to brands such as B Vibe, Spencer Gifts, and Math Magazine. We are so excited to have you today, Dirty Lola. Thank you for having me. That was a great bio, gosh. <laughs> All right, next we have Jessa Jordan. I am a massive, massive fan of you, Jessa Jordan. So I'm kind of fangirling. Um, Jessa Jordan is a fearless, sarcastic, non-monogamous black femme learning, living and loving in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, making ends meet as an independent erotic laborer, writer, educator, indie event coordinator and reproductive justice, human rights and sex, work, sex worker rights advocates. So just doing it all. <laughs> Best known for her viral photo and commentary from the photo project Topless in New York, her role as fe festival director for Abortion Palooza and her work with BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color, Adult Industry Collective. Jessa has been known to drink the blood of misogynists and will punish anyone in the name of the moon. Um, that's the vibes I'm going into for 2021, so I love that. As a writer, her style has been heavily influenced by the prose of Toni Morrison, Miranda July, Charles Bukowski, Anais Nin, and Alex L. Tiny and powerful. Je Jessa swapped climbing trees in her youth for climbing poles in her 20s and is usually found dancing to equal parts Kidney Thieves and Jean Aiko on any given night, but especially at all uh, Inergence pole performance productions in Philadelphia and beyond. We are so happy to have you here. And lastly, but not least, we have King Noir, who is a male performer and fetish trainer and owns and produces and directs royal fetish films with partner Jet Said Jasmine, who is an absolute dream, just so beautiful. King got his start in entertainment as a hip hop artist under the name Hassan Salam. His song Black Exploitation won Best Live Performance and Best Underground Song of the Year from the Underground Music Awards. Honestly, I'm like amongst royalty right now. <laughs> I'm so honored. He has toured internationally with Immortal Technique and was the winner of Fuse TV's Hip Hop President Contest. 
King has appeared on television, including NBC, Fuse, C-SPAN, and PBS, and his music videos have been featured by MTV UK, Fuse, Music Choice, and Video Music Box. King has been a leader in the adult industry, serving as a master fetish trainer, sex educator, and sex expert, believing that sexual expression is an artistic expression. King demonstrates this through sex ed, kinky pop-up events, fetish education, and fetish training seminars with his partner. Um, you should definitely visit his website, kingnoirxxx.com. Um, and what's the other one? I Royalfetishxxx.com as well, right? Yes, I love that website. There's lots of good goodies to buy, photo sets, um, videos, so definitely become a member. All right, I am so excited to be here with y'all. Anything that you want to say before we start? Nope. Okay, so how this is going to go, um, we I have a big list of questions. I'll try to get through all of them as much as possible, but I'm less tied to the questions and more just want to hear from y'all. Just ramble and talk and talk about how you feel about this topic and the questions will just kind of guide the conversation. If we have time at the end or if I finish the questions early, we'll have some time for a Q&A, but if we don't, we don't, we'll just see, okay? So let us begin by defining the concept of anti-racist sex work. Um, and I don't have any specific person for each question, so whoever just wants to start talking is more than welcome to do this. Um, how, how do you kind of define the concept of anti-racist sex work? Uh, for me personally, it would be a lack of discriminatory practices. So what we mean by that is that skin color, um, body size, shape, you know, any sort of like uh, phenotype about a person wouldn't detract from them being hired for specific jobs within the sex industry. I like that. Anyone else? Yeah, I think um, being anti-racist is that you're actively working towards eradicating racism in all in however that shit pops up, you know. So within sex work, it, it would be um, getting sites shut down that promote racist material content and stereotypes, uh, making sure that people in the industry who have any kind of say so uh, are not racist and promoting racist, uh, racist ideals, and then also uh, equal opportunity for people of, of all races, both in front of and behind the camera. And then to add to those amazing definitions, uh, also it's about being more than an ally, being an accomplice. Um, when things don't affect you and when you stand in a place of privilege to speak out about things and make change because you can, um, and you have a way to do that without being punished in the same way a lot of our colleagues can easily be punished and have their livelihoods taken away. Right. Hearing y'all talk, I think about how it, it should be um, innate, innate or inherent to all of our work that um, we are embodying anti-racist practices. But I think it's a lot easier said than done. So I want to ask y'all, what kind of barriers do you think there are to people practicing their sex work in this way? What makes it challenging or difficult for people to be anti-racist in their sex work? Money. Uh, a lot of times money is attached to allowing things to go on. The people at the top who are doing the hiring, who can get you the higher paying jobs, won't hire you if you are saying, no, this makes me uncomfortable, or if you're speaking out against some of the practices they're doing. And in turn, a lot of these people don't want to stop doing these racist things, making these racist products and, and all of these things, unless it affects their wallet. So the biggest hurdle is, is money and, and just not getting blacklisted. A lot of people, when they speak out about things, it, it, it become persona non grata. So that to me is like the biggest hurdle of them all. I'm also thinking a lot about just again like the physical nature of like sex work like we're using we're usually talking about our bodies and so that usually comes with a lot of 
you know, scrutiny if you happen to be like a non-binary person or a trans person or a person who is plus size, right? So just again, like the physicality of it too sometimes can be like a real barrier for people. Um, specifically like for strip clubs, I think like a lot of times like more curvy dancers have a harder time being hired uh, because there's usually just such an emphasis on wanting like a very specific, you know, cis, het, white, skinny, usually like bigger boobed type of dancer in most clubs. Like that person will get hired, you know, a hundred times out of anything in comparison to like, you know, a medium brown skin versus like darker skinned performer who is like curvy all around. So that's like one example I can think of right now at the top. Yeah, I really like that example. Um, what you were saying, Jessa, makes me think of a question I wanna ask is, I know we're gonna talk a lot about anti-racist sex work, but can we just talk a little bit about our experiences, experience, our experiences with racism in sex work? Like what has that looked like? And let's expand it, like racism, classism, disability, what kind of forms of oppression have you experienced within sex work that kind of are just constantly perpetuated? Um, I can give an example. When I first started doing clips and videos, I had a really hard time advertising on many vids without using words like ebony and Nubian and language that I don't feel comfortable with, but I knew that my videos would not have visibility if I wasn't using uh, much more mainstream language. And so it's kind of like, well, what do you do about that? <laughs> um, yeah. I think for me, um, an example that, well, I got a couple of examples that come right to mind. Uh, I was booked to shoot for a company called Asylum and they shoot scenes where it would be a doctor or an orderly with, uh, that would be the male role and the woman's role is usually as a patient in this asylum. And I was booked to be the first black man ever on their site. And instead of having me as a doctor where Dr. Noir sound dope as fuck, um, or even an orderly, they wanted me to be a janitor. They had never had a janitor on this site before, but they were like, oh, black dude, let's let's have a janitor now. Um, they tried to say like, no, no, you know, we can't rewrite it, we can't change it. It's not because you're black, but come on now. You don't have this site for however long you had it. And, you know, now, now all of a sudden you want me to play even a more uh, subservient kind of role, right? Um, and then another time I was on set for a company called Private Society and a performer named April Dawn called me a nigger on set, you know what I'm saying? And the company tried to like explain it away and make it seem like this was okay, you know, and that performer has gone on to be featured on this site and many others, uh, including like Black and all these other things, but she's racist you know, and she's still getting hired. And then there's companies now because of that company that'll say, I'm a problem to work with because I wouldn't allow myself to work with a company where they allow somebody to call me out my name on set. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think there is, and, and I think um, just touched on that fear that people have where it's like, if I'm gonna say, nah, don't call me that shit or nah, I'm not gonna work with a company that uses that, that kind of language that, now I'm not gonna get hired by other companies because somehow I'm a problem. You know what I'm saying? So they they try to, you know, for lack of a better term, blacklist you if you if you stand up for yourself as a human being. So, you know, I think that that's, that's one of the problems where people are like, yo, I gotta eat. You know what I'm saying? So maybe they'll take some some foul treatment that they wouldn't take if if there wasn't their livelihood involved. Thank you for sharing that, King, and I'm sorry that you've had those experiences. Anyone else? So uh, most of my sex work has been via like phone sex, texting, things like that. And when I first started, thankfully not now, but every company, they wanted you to send them like an audition tape and they wanted to hear your black voice, your white voice, not even your white, but it was like, can you sound black? 
And I remember the guy talking, he was like, well, you don't sound like you're black. And I'm like, I promise you I am. Uh, but what does black sound like? I'm like, I'm a black person. This is how I sound. But he's like, you don't, you don't sound urban enough. And can you do a Latina voice? And like, can you do an Asian? Like, can you do an accent? And that was getting a job was like, if you can't do these voices so that when these people call you, you can say whatever while they call you names and do all these things, you're not getting hired. So it's like you, before you even get your foot in the door, you have to like sit there and make a caricature of yourself. Um, and that's most of those, unless you like strike out on your own and you find all the companies you can work for yourself. And like, thankfully I found a place where that's, I get to be me and I don't have to be a voice, but that's a thing too. And also like, oh, what do you look like? And can we, um, like, oh, you're black, but we want to use, and for, and it was such a thing. It was like, they wanted to use a photo of a darker skinned black woman for me, because it was like the epitome to a fetishize was to have the racist call in. Cause like, look who you can call a nigga, like, look who you can, like, this person's going to take your call. And you couldn't say no. Um, with a lot of these, you do not get to say, I don't want to take this call. You don't get to tap out if they're being racist and you get penalized if you don't allow them to talk to you any kind of way. And so to the privilege to find a company that's like, I literally can hang up on people. I'm like, no, you don't get to, unless we are negotiating <laughs> what, what's happening, um, it doesn't get to happen. But that's a huge thing. And for people who can't do the physicality of sex work and rely on this kind of sex work, when that big barrier of you have to fetishize yourself or else you can't even be yourself or else like that's it's, it's and a lot of times you're the only you might not be the only brown person but they're only going to feature one black face so you're all playing the same black girl and sometimes the white girls are playing the black girl as well <laughs> they're iggy as alien it so that's right. what's happening <laughs> yes so awesome that. um yeah, no, it, that's kind of been like one of the things that I've run into the most, you know, uh, so my career has gone through like many different phases. And so um, even as a nude model, you know, and someone who is like pretty distinctly alternative, like I have facial piercings and tattoos and um, have always had like a non-standard form of hair in some capacity, whether that meant that it was like neon colored or um, I had an Afro for a while um, and now I have a shaved head most of the time. So it's just like, it's always about playing into that role of what the mainstream wants to see or what they view as attractive. Um, and then again, like being asked now to wear wigs, you know, to make myself more of a, you know, commonly attractive like person. Um, also like when I was stripping, I remember distinctly like this one customer that I had came in, um, and he was like an older white guy. He didn't see, like, he seemed super unassuming, but like we went back and did like, he wanted to do three dances and in the middle of the first, you know, I turned around. And so I was like, my back was to him and he wanted me to put my arms behind my back, which I already was getting like spidey sensor vibes, like something's about to go down. Um, but I did it and I kind of just like tried to see like what was about to happen. And he pulled my arms like super taut so that he could see all the muscles in my back. And he was like, you're a strong nigger. And I was just like, wow, okay, this is like the end of this. Um, so I just immediately like got up and like collected all the money and went to the manager's station and was like, hey, like this guy just said this, you know, like I'm not dancing for him anymore. And I'd really like him to be removed from the club. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it because they were like, well, he's spending money to be here. And, you know, he's like a paid client. Like he's gotten danced with other people. No one's ever complained about him. Like they gave me the laundry list of bullshit, you know, in order to shut me down and make me feel like what I was doing by protecting myself and removing myself from that situation was unacceptable. So very similar to King where it's like, you know, you could be blacklisted for something like that. You can not get hired at clubs for something like that. Like, because they think that you are a problem, you're gonna cause like issues for their client base. Uh, my blood is kind of boiling with this conversation. And I'm also thinking now about the, the, I think two or three times that I've been called a nigger from clients and just that that is such a pervasive experience um, as we kind of fucked up right now. 
So let's let's switch gears a little bit. And I'd love to hear from all three of you about this. And I'll probably pitch in a little bit too, but um, what anti-racist structures, and also I just wanted to kind of quickly divert for a second and add my own two cents about anti-racism um, in that it includes like recentering certain voices, black voices, specifically black queer, um, gender non-conforming voices, um, but it also encompasses so many other movements, including like the disability justice movement, um, things around class, things around immigration. And so I think anti-racism um, as, a, as a kind of, yeah, as an organizing tool and a movement is, is, very, is a very big thing that we're working on. Um, so what kind of anti-racist structures have you tried to build within your sex work and within your practice um, and like, could you just give some experiences, some examples of experiences around this? I think this is really exciting. I'm muted and muted. Um, so again, calling myself on the privilege that I have to do this, but not working for those companies anymore, taking the time to find, uh, you know, a place where paramount, like my safety, my sanity is paramount. Um, and that they're not going to stand for someone doing that out of, out of book, like somebody will get blocked if and not be able to call anybody in the company if they go off book when we're, we've told them no, and things like that, that kind of pushback. Um, taking the money that I get from some of this privilege and putting it back into mutual aid, um, there's like Venus Cuffs is a sex worker here in, in New York who does a lot with mutual aid. So we're dropping her blessings when I can to try to do that because she's on the ground doing a lot more than, <laughs> than anybody right now in the government for folks. So doing things like that and then doing stuff like this, speaking out because I have the space, like I can speak about all the shit that's going down and I know I'm going to be okay. And I always tell people, I'm like, you invite me to your party, but I'm still going to take the mic and talk shit about you if there's shit to talk about you. And so I've, I've done that and I always make room to do that. And I know maybe sometimes people don't um, invite me back, but I'm also super likable. And I, you know, so it, it makes people mad that I'm like, yeah, but you can't black miss, blackmail me everywhere because people love me. So yeah. Know what you're gonna do so that's I, I try to do those things where my privilege can take me and and on the back end of things calling companies out like i've had companies approach me and when they say they want to work with me and i'm like i don't like this um i'm not going to work with you or if you want to work with me the, these are some things i need to see these are some things you need to do you can pay me to help you be less racist? Do you, do you wanna do that? Let, or, hey, let me pass this job on. Here's somebody who can help you um, and tapping other POC. Those are things like on the back end that really in like the sex ed industry, especially we're trying to do because the public call out helps to a degree, but the general public doesn't, they don't care. I mean, they don't know and they don't care. Like it's not, they just want their dildos. They don't, and yes, they're looking at the packaging, but they're not even realizing how much they're being brainwashed to use shitty words like tranny and calling everybody ebony that's black and mandingo and shit like that. So going on the back end and saying, listen, in the long run, you're going to be better off if you stop doing shit like this. Um, you're, you're getting into a new generation of folks like these babies out here are not playing. They are not playing these games. They are not here for this mess. And I'm like, all these we're aging out. The people that are buying your products are aging out. So I'm on the back end going, you need to get ready for this new generation who's just going to stop fucking with you. Um, and so that's a lot of what I'm trying to do just on the back end of like, you might not see it, but you might see things slowly creeping and changing and like trying to stay in that and not get burnt out, but like keep at it. And I, if I can just add, I think what you're saying, it can be so difficult sometimes, Dirty Lola, because I think earlier you mentioned money. I remember when I was a baby sex worker, like I knew that I was um, perpetuating my fetishization, but that was the only way that I could make money. And now that I'm in a place where I'm more established, I'm like, I'm trying to have such a, a big voice in this area of like calling shit out and like, oh yeah, you think it's cute that I'm African? Let's read some Audre Lorde together and hopefully make space for the people that don't have the 
ability because they're still trying to just survive and make money. We need to like, there's enough space for all of us to be making money together. And so kind of, I think exactly what you're saying, like using your voice because in some ways there's a little bit of privilege that you can to do that, I think is really important. Other thoughts, other folks? I think a lot of times, like even just having the discussion about like where language can take us in the future, because um, there's all of this dialogue that's happening now on Twitter about whether or not BIPOC should be stricken from our language and how like, you know, it's erasing blackness from the conversation somehow because it's lumping all black people in with people um, who are Latinx or Asian and native and you know, it, so it's like somehow like giving other people elevation to speak over black people, which in my opinion, doesn't make any sense. Um, but, you know, having that foresight of, okay, well, we don't want to use terms like Ebony. We don't want to use terms like uh, BBC or, you know, Mandingo or whatever. So like, where, where are we having these conversations and like, how are we trying to shape what categorizations are moving forward and what is actually getting phased out. Um, so I guess that's like one thing that I try to contribute is that, you know, I'm a writer, I usually am like putting out articles and just being very specific about the language that I use, making sure that people address me or my peers online with the language that we want to see being used. Um, and just really forcing that down people's throats. Like you're not going to fucking call us this anymore. Um, in addition to like elevating people who are doing the work, you know, um, Lola mentioned one person that was in New York and um, there are a few groups that are here in Philly as well. Uh, SWAP is always great, um, you know, just for the fact that they do work across the border of um, people who are incarcerated and people who are on the outside. Um, and just like, there's a collective here called Stilettos um, that is doing work to kind of like redefine what uh, the strip club experience can look like for people and making that anti-racist as well. Um, there's like a list of others that I could name off right now, but I don't want to like take too much time up. I want to let King speak. So, yeah. I think, I think for me, um, and, and came to sex work at different times in our lives and from 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 different roads we traveled on to get to the same spot but we realized the same thing and that was there is a huge lack of representation uh -oh. the king froze for me did king freeze for anyone else in the industry sorry, i'm sorry i don't know if uh, if i have frozen for a second yeah, could you okay, say Okay, hopefully like, I'm yeah. hopefully I'm back now. You are. Um yes. the for for both of us we realize that there is a huge gap in representation for the full spectrum of black sexuality. You know, um we were doing parties for people and you know, our primary uh attendees of our of our events were black women between the age of 25 and 45 who were like, "Look, I don't see myself represented in porn at all." I don't see black women get kissed. <laughs> I don't see no passion. I don't see us involved in BDSM unless we are overly fetishized and you know made to be in all these racist, racist um, stereotypes and tropes. So we were like, you know what, fuck it, we gonna make something. You know, and I think that it's so so important whether it's Royal Fetish Films or Jessa Jordan or whoever whoever the performers and the companies are is like we have to support. Black owned businesses everywhere, but especially within sex work. Especially when you see people who are stepping out, like, yo, I'm not involved in none of this racist shit. I'm not taking these racist jobs. I'm not working with, with companies or people who treat us as less than human beings or any differently than they would treat anybody else in business, period. So, like, we have to actually be anti racist and active in, you know, and that if we know that there are strip clubs out there that hire, you know, uh, 
all different kinds of people and all different kinds of body types, then we need to take guys there and support that strip club and support, you know, sex toy companies that show all different types of us and actually have, you know, our different skin tones, not just, you know, matte black dildo, your black dildo, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's, it's very important that we actually take, you know, an active role in supporting and whether that's creating it ourselves where we see where there's not someone who is, you know, a dominatrix that's making motherfuckers read a book, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, that, and you go and take that, take that reign and do that shit. Like it's so important because when we add our flavor and the uniqueness of what makes us black, we add a flavor to the shit that's not there. They've been imitating us for so long and trying to get paid where we should, we need to bring our authenticity and who we are to the game and then also work with others and support others that are doing the same. You know, just, as you were talking, oh, go ahead, Jessa. Just to piggyback off that really quickly too, um, there was like another thing that happened on Twitter not too long ago um, where someone left a comment about an article that I had written about, um, you know, moving forward with pornography and making it anti-racist as a uh, industry overall. And um, I think we also need to give more space to companies and brands and people who are making that effort, you know, if they have transgressed POCs in the past are now moving forward with like, you know, if they're not actually like putting POCs directly on like their boards or like their company mastheads or whatever the fuck, but um, also just like speaking more to performers of color or like, you know, whether they're independent or mainstream performers and actually getting their input and then like putting that back into their products that they're releasing. Um, Cause I know that that's the thing that we tend to harp on where it's like, oh, well this, this company did this racist thing like six years ago. And like, now they're trying to do all this woo shit and we don't believe in it. It's like, well, if they're actually making the effort and it does look like that's what they're trying to do moving forward, then like, we can't keep like holding them back from that. Um, so just that one little piece. As you were talking, Jessa, I'm looking up these two books that I'm reading right now, but I cannot remember um, their names. Uh, one of them is We Will Not Cancel Us by Adrienne Marie Brown. It's a really short read um, talking about like, like we need to be canceling our oppressors and not folks within our community, but also what is like restorative and transformative justice look like? Kind of what you're saying, Jessa, if folks fuck up, how do we make space for folks to make amends and build a better future and like work on themselves? And I think that's something that that's a space that we could grant to these companies and to individuals if they are willing to make that change. Um, the second thing I was thinking about, because you've brought up Twitter a lot, and I think Twitter and social media is so important. I'm reading um, Feminista Jones, Reclaiming Our Space from the Tweets to the Streets. And she talks about social media and Twitter as a form of art and like knowledge sharing um, and where a lot of like information is originated. Um, but the reason why I said that is because I just think that language is so important. I haven't heard this discourse around BIPOC yet, um, but I wanna just, something that I want to just say is that anti-racism is not a monolithic movement and we have to be centering blackness specifically because anti-blackness is so rampant brown folks and allies can be so anti-black. And I think with the, with the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and everything, we have to be centering blackness and like fat black bodies and dark skinned bodies and, and black bodies, however they look within this. And so not just being like, like yeah, not being very um, watered down or anti-racism cannot be watered down. Um, I wanted to add that to the conversation. Um, this is so great. We have so many questions still. Let me pick through some. We've talked about that. Um, can I just ask y'all, and it, you, don't, you all don't have to answer this, but how does um, sex work intersect with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and other movements for racial justice? Where, where do we fall? Where do we go within the Black Lives Matter movement? I think that's a really good question because there is such a 
people try to act like black folks are one monolithic group. You know, um, there are black folks that's conservative. There are black folks that's more liberal. There are black folks that are both, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but like when we, when we talk about um, actually moving forward, we have to put a whole lot of that shit on a back burner. There's this Malcolm X speech. That's one of my favorite Malcolm X speeches ever. He said, I don't come to you as a Democrat or a Republican. I don't come to you as a X, Y, his name are just all the things I come to you. He's not, not as a Muslim or a Christian. I come to you as a black man. That's what I am first, you know? And as black people, we have to do that. Because if we allow ourselves to get fractioned up into all these little splintered off groups, it's so much easier to subvert us and to cut off the head of any, any type of movement. Uh, I do think though, within our community, there are a whole lot of folks that need to, 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 to step up. And I'm calling out other black men on this. Um, black men have oppressed other black folk for too damn long for a spot on a totem pole that does not exist. Thinking that you're better than black women, thinking that you're better than black trans folk or, or LGBTQ or, or any other black people for that matter. Like we have to actually step up and be allies in that way. And, and I think you said uh, not just allies, but accomplices in the way of making sure that black women, black trans women are safe, making sure that black folk in general are safe and just thinking that, you know, I'm a black man. So, you know, I'm gonna go take this job uh, fucking with this company that never hires black women, but it's called black is somehow not um, racist and, and fucking over a lot of uh, performers and sex workers in my own industry. You can't have that mentality. You can't be like, yo, I'm, I'm a superstar black male talent, but I don't shoot with black women. You know what I'm saying? Like that shit is crazy. Or if, and if, or don't promote other black companies or shoot with black companies, that shit is crazy. Um, and, and we have to actually step up and 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 show that black folk are safe amongst black men. You know what I'm saying? I think that that is is very important, and that goes for where it tra where it um, intersects between Black Lives Matter and and the sex work community, and then also other black folk got to recognize sex work is work, and a whole lot of your favorite. Uh, Black folk throughout history have either been sex workers or been or fallen under the LGBTQ. And you know, this specifically, this kind of positioning of black men against black women um, or black queer folks is a, is a deliberate construction of white supremacy and imperialism and colonialism, colonial, colonialism specifically. I think about like pre Klansmen vigilantes running through um, Memphis in like their early 1900s and making black men watch them rape black women. They're, they put us against each other to dismantle our sense of community. And so it's actually going against white supremacy and furthering our liberation for us to be united and in solidarity and, and, for, and for us to understand that we're not a monolith, but that we, our liberation is tied together. And I think about like the civil rights movement and how black women were not, were too black to be part of the feminist movement but we're two women to be part of the, the race, racial movement. It's white supremacy that makes these divisions. And so it's so important for us as a community, as a, as a race, whatever the fuck that even really means to be in solidarity with each other. Yeah, thank you, King. Anyone else wanna to add to this question about the Black Lives Matter movement? Just adding like, I think the biggest thing is a lot of when 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 Black Lives Matter and a lot of the protests were really heavily happening, there was a lot of conversation about the Black uh, trans folks who were being murdered and nobody was saying anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we have to be one, but I think we also need to remind each other that there are subsets of us that exist that we don't, we aren't supporting 
when we say those words and that we are forgetting about them because their names aren't lifted up in the same way. We're not making murals of them. We're not saying their names. So it's like, yes, we do need to come together and not be like in our separate groups, but at the same time, we do need to remember, like we're a variety. We That is the magical thing about black folks is that we look all different ways. We're shaped all different ways. We can do all different things. We are the originators of so much. And a lot of times that's been stolen from us. And then we turn against things like LGBTQ folks, folks in alternative relationships. And we suddenly label it as that's white shit. It's like, no, that's black shit that you forgot about and that you didn't know about and you didn't learn about. So we get to be and need to be a part of that movement. And I think when we show up in it and then identify ourselves, it's like, I'm here and I'm black, but also I'm queer, I'm a woman, I'm poly, you know, these are the things I am and I'm still black. Black's at the top of that list, but here are all the other things. And so, yes, we need to pull everybody in. And I think that's, our role is to be in it and not hide ourselves within it and tell people what we do and that we deserve to be a part of this and that our liberation is tied all together. And so, we're going to all get lifted up and people can't be like, oh, but not these people, <laughs> you know, we, we're going to leave y'all behind. It's like, no, you got to take all of us need to go together. So, yeah. We are not free. One is not free until we are all free. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. I'm doing a quick time check. We have five minutes left. I have, um, I actually have an additional question I wanted to ask Dirty Lola specifically, and I'll have one question and then give us time to kind of plug our social medias and like cash apps and stuff like that. Um, but Dirty Lola, um, something I didn't mention about myself is that I uh, practice ethical non-monogamy. I think it's so important. And that's something that you have mentioned in your bio and just brought up polyamory, things like that. Um, do you see non-monogamy or polyamory being a part of anti-racism? And if so, um, how? And I'm sorry, I'm singling you out. It's just no, it's fine. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. I think, well, a lot of, especially with the non-monogamous movement has been a lot of white men acting like they invented it when we know that black folks were doing this for ages. Like they learned it from us. <laughs> they learned it from watching you. Like that's where they got this from. So it's coming, part of it is dismantling that and, and also show in another way. Like I always tell people, it's like, we don't have to, you don't have to abandon monogamy if that's not your, you know, if that's where you're at and you're good at it. But a lot of us aren't. And it's because there are other ways to be that we're not taught. And I think when you get in those spaces, you have to make room because what's happening is a lot of black folks are coming into those spaces and it's full of bullshit and it's full of racist white folks. And so then they're like, oh, this isn't for me. And then like, they're not, they're not able to really learn and stretch and grow because they're letting, you know, white people are going, oh, this is ours. It's like, no, 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 no. This is ours and y'all are welcome to it. So I think there's work that needs to be done. A lot of work that needs to be done within it. A lot of folks are out there doing the work within it, but um, it is, a, I'm always, I try to talk to, you know, black folks about polyamory. And it's like, you're what you're telling me, I'll have conversations. I'm like, okay, y'all are polyamorous. <laughs> It's, you may not be into it ethically, but it sounds like all you need to know is just like, oh, I know what he's doing, but I don't care. Okay, that's it's polyamory if you just had a conversation about it. Like you're doing this and then you're telling me, oh, I don't fuck with that. It's like you literally are fucking with that. <laughs> you're literally doing it. So it, it's like, I think the divide is when you see the shenanigans and you're like, I'm going to stay over here. So yes, definitely within polyamory, there's a lot of anti-racism and unpacking that needs to be done and is being done, but whew, we got work to do. <laughs> Thank you. And I know Jessa that you talk about being non-monogamous as well. So um, I just wanted to uplift that because I think it's an important thing to do. All right. The last question in our ooh, three minutes that we have left, um, what, uh, which one do I want to ask? What are some, what are some tips or resources you have for folks who would like to root their practice more in anti-racism? And you can just give a short answer. Any tips, any resources? People can definitely uh, hit me up. I will give you a very, very long reading list. I think the more that we know about our history 
And as far back as we can read up on our history, like I would suggest to everybody, do research on what relationships, love and sexuality and gender was like pre-colonialism. It is so important to decolonize our sex lives. You will find so much out about yourself and how you feel right now. You'd be like, oh shit, my horny been going on for thousands and thousands of years back in my ancestors time. You could even look at the um, pantheons of, 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 of Orishas and our, um, our history of how we worshiped and how we lived. And you will find out so much just about what was just mentioned in regards to polyamory, even monogamy, whatever the case being like, yo, black folk did that shit already. BDSM, um, fetishism, all of that shit. We've been doing it. It's not some white people shit. It's some our shit. And it's very, very important that when you know the history, it makes you feel so much better about yourself. You don't feel like you're lost in a sea of, of somebody else-ness. You know what I'm saying? You find yourself. Thank you, King. What about you, Jessa? I also think it's important to diversify your experiences and check um, I guess like going back to more of the dating practices, check yourself when and if you find yourself um, in a situation that feels strange, like really, like people need to learn to understand their own feelings and their intuitions, because that's something else that white supremacy teaches us that like we need to like get away from, like just go on along with the flow. Um, but yeah, like check your intuition. Like if you went on a date with someone and something that they said really stuck with you that felt fucking weird and gross, like understand that like that's valid and that you don't have to just be like, oh, like this person's attractive. So I should just continue on with whatever the fuck they want to do. Like, cause then it will give you the space to start calling people out when it's happening in real time. Cause a lot of people also like don't always feel comfortable doing that. And it's until you learn like, you have to first learn your feelings about something before you can actually start to speak on it. Thank you, Jessa. And Dirty Lola, in the last like 30 seconds that we have left, yeah, what would you Just say? really quick, a resource. Um, I've been compiling the black and brown sex educators, marginalized folks um, who speak to different things, folks with disabilities, but who talk about sex and relationships and love because a lot of the things I hear from folks, they're like, I wanna learn more, but I don't wanna learn this from a cis, white, able-bodied person. They want somebody who looks like, like them. So if you follow me on Twitter, I have a group you can follow. It's called the Lola Dex and it's literally just marginalized folks. And there's everybody from sex toy makers, sex educators, performers, but it's people who you can go and follow and then like once you follow that person because that's the nest egg is you got to diversify who you're following because those are the voices if you're getting a lot of your messaging from social media which a lot of people are you have to make that area look like you want it to look like it has to be full of voices of the folks that you want to hear more from and that look like you and you can't keep just going with everybody who doesn't look like you. And then you're like, well, why am I not getting this messaging? So I made that resource so folks can, and you can just follow the group and it's a whole separate, it'll give you a whole separate timeline of just those folks. So yeah, check that out. Awesome, thank you all. This has been such an amazing conversation. I'm so sad it's coming to an end. So let's end with, starting with you, Dirty Lola. Could you, what's your Twitter? Are you on Instagram? What's your yeah. website? And yep, I'm for Venmo? Okay, so I'm Dirty Lola on both uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, my website is sexedagogo.com. We're in hiatus right now because it's a pandemic. So we're not doing live shows. Um, and my Venmo is at DLola and my PayPal is dirtylola69 at yahoo.com. Awesome, Jessa, your turn. I'm Miss Jessa Jordan on all social media platforms. Uh, my website is coming soon and my Venmo and my PayPal are both Jessa Says. So J-E-S-S-A-S-A-Y-S. -S -S -S. Awesome, thank you, Jordan. And King? You can find me at The Real King Noir on Instagram, at King Noir on uh, Twitter and OnlyFans. I'm shadow banned just about everywhere. So uh, Google me until you find me. KingNoirXXX.com is the website. Awesome. And for me, I'm at Miss V Chicago on Twitter and Instagram. 
um, Miss B Chicago on Cash App at Velvet Dreams 666 <laughs> on Venmo. My website is miss velvetcom And I am one of the executive directors at Swap USA, Sex Workers Outreach Project. So get at me if you want to do some local organizing in your local community. Um, thank you all for such a great conversation. And it has been a blast. And I hope that folks that tuned in enjoyed themselves as much as I did. All right, take care, everyone.